So without further ado, I do wanna go ahead and introduce you to our first speaker tonight. That is Jan Fried. She's a professor of American Sign Language and English Interpreter Education at the University of Hawaii Kapiolani Community College in Honolulu. She is also the interim academic advisor for the Kapiolani Deaf Center. She served on numerous state, regional, and national committees pertaining to the deaf, hard of hearing, and interpreting communities. Jan has a lot on her plate right now, and we are so appreciative that she made the time to join us for this session. Jan, we do want to very warmly welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us. Mahalo very much, Sarah. Thank you so much, all of you, and for a big shout out to NFLRC. I am thrilled to be here, and let's go ahead and get this party started. By the way, um, this Cooking ASL in the COVID the kitchen, leveraging language learning tools to entice and engage really does encompass this <laughs> sort of cooking and teaching competition over the last two years that we've been going through. And I should say that it I will be including cell and then some cell also being another word for salt. So and that's a seasoning. So this works perfectly with my theme. And we will go ahead and give you some information about how um, some of the things that I needed to do to be able to teach ASL effectively. And some of my colleagues did some, something similar. So um, as Sarah said, I'm a professor of American Sign Language and American Sign Language and English Interpretation Education at Kapilani Community College in Honolulu, Hawaii. And like you, I'm in the kitchen and sometimes things just cook up beautifully my, and the classes are great and sometimes they just need a little tweaking and that's why we're having this conversation today and really it's going to be a stir fry and not a souffle <laughs> because the time is of the essence. When um, we had to transition from face to face classes to COVID, um, in, during COVID into remote. And then we chose to do synchronous learning for ASL. Actually, some of my colleagues chose asynchronous. Um, it was really about feeding the need and figuring out how to successfully provide engaging language learning experiences and opportunities um, in an entirely new environment for all learners. And something that I consider is that I, I not only have students who can hear, I have sometimes students who are hard of hearing, sometimes students who are deaf, um, st students who are a variety of different kinds of learners are taking ASL. But first, I want to know from all of you, this is the poo-poos. So for those of you who don't know, poo-poo is another word. Um, it's actually a local term for appetizers. So the appetizer round, I'd like to know what tools you use in your language instruction or your classes. But what I'd like for you to do is um, as I list all of these different types of tools, if you can just start putting them in chat, don't hit send yet. I'll let you know when we need to hit send. And then I'd love to be able to see what everyone has to say. So some of the tools that I use um, and, and can't use are here, cloud, word cloud, Flipgrid, Mentimeter, Bitmojis, Jamboard, Polls, Kahoot, Nearpod, name changes, like if you're on the screen and you're changing your name, you want students to be able to respond to something. Emojis, there we go. Padlet, the chat, Go React, which is a um, coding sort of software, feedback software, recordings, audio notes, others. So if you can put in chat what you use, go. I'd love to see what you have to say. While you're doing that, I wanna give a big shout out to K-12 educators because without you and all the cool tools you've been using all this time, those of us at the post-secondary level would not have a clue about how to do some of these really cool things. So yeah, I would say thank you. I'm with Sarah, probably using half or more of these things. And you see the little unhappy faces at the bottom. It's because some cool tools just don't work for ASL um, because we are also, yeah, Miro, I forgot about Miro um, and Google Slides, absolutely. Yeah, 
Shout out to K-12 instructors. So thank you so much because really you've informed us and it's improved my teaching um, and what things I've had to do to be able to transition successfully and to be able to meet students' needs in a variety of different ways to be able to keep them engaged. So thank you for sharing. So <laughs> the COVID challenge, I have my original recipe, my class, and American Sign Language generally is taught. It's a three-dimensional language, right? So teaching in a classroom with, a, with either a, a U or some sort of a, a three-quarter shaped classroom, students can see each other, I can see them. It's very, very it's highly visual, um, highly interactive so that we can see signs and each other from various perspectives. It's easy to make corrections because I can, I can, with a sweep, I can see everybody all at once and be able to then walk over to them, maybe make some sort of correction with their permission to be able to touch their hands and be able to manipulate um, their hand shapes. Um, I can do some full body modeling. Basically, I could jump around and I can go ahead and show what the sign needs to look like and or variations of the signs. So I can give some of their semantic meaning. Um, it's very, very easy. Plus, I tend, because of my art background, <laughs> I tend to do a lot of drawing on whiteboard or chalkboard, depending upon, or flip charts, whatever I've got in my classroom. <clears throat> And switching made this a real challenge because I tend, because I'm trying to keep English out of the classroom because the target language is American Sign Language. I really want the students to be processing and thinking as much as they possibly can in American Sign Language. So drawing whenever I can is what I try to do. So some of those things, this original recipe, and we're using curriculum that is a functional, notional, communicative approach, natural language learning. Um, we use a video text besides having a book that has some things in English, but a lot of it's on video. And, you know, it's looking at social, emotional, and cultural learning is very much included in um, our curriculum. So that was the same method, but different results. Yeah, some of it didn't work. And burned, I definitely burned a few dishes along the way trying to figure out how to do this. So I had to figure out quickly how we're going to use technology and be like, ah, you know, I've used Zoom before. Yeah, yeah, I kind of know what this is. It's like Zoom, Zoom. <laughs> oh my gosh. It, trying to use a two dimensional platform for a three dimensional language is banana pants. So you have to be able to see something from all, from all angles. So if I'm looking at this particular block, gives you different perspectives. Hard to do this in two dimensions to really get a good sense of what needs to happen. And I'll talk about this later. So I need to figure out the best way to present the material and new signs because I've got this box. When in a classroom, I have got the whole room. And because sunny space, it's difficult here. I can move back a bit, but then it gets harder to see. So I had to think about the ergonomics, which is a real challenge actually. And then, um, and new was using things like class recordings. Oh my gosh, that was a boon. And I'm gonna have to actually, in just a second, clap because I've lights clap on, clap off in my room. So sorry, it's, a, it's on a um, sensor and sometimes they can't see me behind my screen. Um, using Google Docs, I'm still sharing screen, oh. Did I not? Yes, I am sharing screen. Yes, I'm still sharing my screen. Um, and improve tools and technology. And uh, then I had to figure out what was gonna, I was gonna keep, recycle and trash. And I have to say, there's lots of uh-oh spaghetti-o moments in, <laughs> during this whole process. So it didn't mean that I can't teach. It meant that I just needed to be able to try things repeatedly, and that's what ended up happening. So is, so, and I, I'm using my slides if that's, a, if that's a problem, so my screen is being shared. So rapid recipe redo, and then I'm gonna ask you if this, the same thing was true for you. So I needed to, I felt like I was cooking with one hand tied behind my back. 
And I will mention in a second, the professional development opportunities that I had to make sure that um, it was all gonna work. And not just me, but all my colleagues, we were very fortunate here at Kapilani Community College to have some amazing professional development from our design team and our distance education teams. So I needed to make it multimodal. So in a classroom, if I'm seeing everyone face-to-face, -face, being able to get information to them was very easy. Write it on the board, I can sign it, I can have it on my slide. But I had to make it multimodal in the sense of, because of the high anxiety, and I have a feeling probably all of you experienced this high anxiety and stress that students were feeling as we switched over midstream from being face-to-face -to, -face to remote. Information on slides, information on Laulima, which is our electronic management system, um, signed, emailed, I linked it, it was in the chat. <laughs> I had announcements that I sent, sent text sometimes, had in the syllabus. That still sometimes wasn't enough information. The same information in all of those methods to be able to make sure students were getting in, be able to follow directions, um, because I think of the initially the high anxiety that was happening for students. Um, and then the cool thing was adding class recordings. So students had a chance to be able to review. They were able to relax and go, I can see this again, which is really quite nice. Then um, tool and technique tweaks. Yeah, you probably figured out I like alliteration. <laughs> So I needed, I have a, I have an airbook. Yeah, that wasn't in, uh, when I have a class of 18 students or more. Um, it's very difficult to be able to see them on a, on an airbook. So I needed an extra screen, a large monitor, so I could be able to see my slides, the students, they need to be able to see me. And I had to be able to, again, figure out how to, to teach a three-dimensional language on a two-dimensional platform that is audio-based. So it's audio based. <clears throat> so be able from all angles and to be able to be interactive and to be able to um, understand that it wasn't just me who was having technical limitations, that I thought my students were super tech savvy. And in fact, they were not, which was a very interesting realization and sort of, um, sort of, um, I, it, it was, it was comforting, I should say. So the other thing too is reality bites. And I had to, again, going from a two, three-dimensional environment to a two-dimensional environment, I had to be Wizard of Oz. So when the Wizard of Oz says, pay no attention to the man be or the person behind the curtain, that's exact. I felt like I was pushing buttons and moving levers to be able to constantly make sure students could see me, I could see them. I, they could see my slides because, and, and because this is, this is an audio based platform, my students are allowed to talk in class. So I had to be able to watch them, pin them, spotlight them, spotlight me, have them move the slider, and to be able to make sure that whenever a question was up, the student was asking questions, they were, we were side by side so that students could track them because finding out that in an audio based class, a little bit different, but in a, when a visually based class, some of my students were on their phones, some of them were on tablets, some of them were on laptops, some of them were on desktops, some of them had wonky Wi Fi, um, some of them had new material, new technology, and everything in between. And so sometimes students were having a very difficult time being able to see each other, let alone just me. So being able to find and understand how and what students were seeing. So I had to review recordings to make sure, oh, wait a minute, if I'm going to put my insert myself onto a slide and it's going to be recorded, where do I put that? Where do I put that image to make sure students can see the content material and be able to see me uh, delivering the content material. And as I mentioned, yes, thank you so much, Alicia. Um, there are lots of things. <laughs> I really did feel like Wizard of Oz, I still do. So, and also because I said, I love drawing. Um, using the whiteboard on Zoom is so constricting and restrictive. It is, I don't have the, the flexibility. It's not nimble enough for me to be able to do what I need to do. So I use it occasionally, it's fine. And then um, dealing with students' anxiety and depression uh, is probably been more profound over the last two years. I know all of you were experiencing this, but it's not just solely related to students taking ASL. 
but that transition was so rapid and students having to do take classes that they didn't expect that they would have to take remotely choose students choosing to be face to face students who are now having to be remote learners. Um, fortunately, we were being able to do it synchronously, which helped tremendously so I could at least have a connection with my students. And no, and it was really actually turned out to be a very intimate experience in the last two years because they're seeing me so close um, and I'm seeing them so close. And by the way, no virtual backgrounds. This, I have a sheet and I have a sheet at home too because I'm also an interpreter and I do do video relay interpreting. So video remote interpreting, excuse me. And virtual backgrounds means our hands disappear. So some students like to fuzz out their rooms, but for me, there's no virtual backgrounds. And sort of, as I say, swiftly swap seasonings, learning, the new tools and the ways to interact with the content on Zoom, finding out what works, what like things like, I can't use a QuickTime player. I had to actually use VLC um, to be able to show videos because it just was, they weren't compatible. Uh, looking at the fact that I could very quickly in a face-to-face -face classroom have people work with their elbow partners and they could quickly do pair, pair work. I could actually change the configuration of the activities, small group activities, any way I wanted to. I could be much more spontaneous and I could not do that. Um, also to have all 18 people on the screen and then have them sign to each other. Some instructors have done that and students have told me that they have a hard time seeing the instructor signing, if they're fingerspelling their name, um, seeing each other finger spell or sign. So having to put them in break rooms is great. And I love break rooms. However, it's harder to monitor. So I can't just sit there. Like I can be in a classroom and I can look at all of the small groups and I can quickly, um, jump in, give some corrections, re re explain the activity, um, a little bit more cumbersome, but using chat a lot has been great to be able to monitor students and then to be able to make sure their students, and this is interesting, it's exhausting for the, uh, for the students and for myself, is being on camera 100% of the time. So other classes, different types of content, students can turn themselves off, it's polite actually, um, but students have to be on and have their hands in the air. And so they're in their own room or whatever space that they're in, trying to copy my signs because they have to be, and have it set so, it, they don't have to do any cognitive switching. They can just simply copy the signs, but to make sure that they're, that they are interacting with the information, even though they're not interacting with each other in a classroom or in a situation. Yeah. <laughs> taking a student, deaf students taking foreign language classes is very, very interesting. And one that's much more effective when it's face-to-face -face than online, depending, but depending on the student's needs. What I wanted to show you is an example of how I tweak the technique. So as I said, um, I showed you, I've got these, I have box. These are manipulatives and these are for teaching descriptive classifiers. How do you describe something? How do you describe people? In a face-to-face -face class, I have lots of these. So I have multiple, so I can set students up in pairs. They each have the same set of manipulatives. Um, they put a barrier up, one goes ahead and builds something, they have to describe it, color, shape, size, they're using adjectival and adverbial information on their face. So it's not only doing what they're doing manually, but also non-manually, and then they can whoo, show each other. So I had to figure out how to do this activity virtually. So not everyone has toys and blocks, I do. <laughs> lots of toys at home. Um, but I thought, okay, what can I do? So in this case, this activity, I had them go, first of all, getting them up and out into their rest of their space is great. One of the things I had to do was learn how to shorten activities because even an hour and 40 minute class is too long, too long for them to sit on their, on their, on their little fannies. And so um, getting them up and getting them, finding something and coming back keeps them engaged. And so finding a pair, so it was like a, you know, a bigger and better hunt. Um, a pair of chopsticks, a marker, toothbrush, cereal bowl, or ice cream bowl, small ball, coffee cup, things that I know they would have or something similar. So they then, the, the trick was then they had to arrange them and below the screen until they finished building it, they had to describe it. Then the partner would 
aim their camera at their piece and then the, then the originator, um, the creator would aim their camera at their work and, and then compare. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this was one of those, these things that I have, these are highly interactive, particularly in this class where they're using a lot of different types of classifiers because ASL is very heavy and how we are using space to be able to describe um, location and verbs um, and uh, descriptions and, you know, so adverbs and adverbs, all this is happening within a classifier. So it's making sure students really have enough opportunities to be able to manipulate things and be engaged. Um, the other, oh, actually, sorry, I wanted to, um, the other thing I had to do, so we had, Historically, one of the units as they're learning how to describe things is it culminates in a cooking demonstration. So in the past, it's been like all the students, they bring, they cook whatever item they're going to, they're going to describe, they come to class with it, everyone has a big feast, and then they go ahead and they go through the recipe. Well, obviously, in the, in the time of COVID, that went out the window. So it really gave the students an opportunity to make cooking shows. Well, there's a plethora of them on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram. So I was able to find lots of deaf creators and deaf chefs to be able to show them how a deaf person does a cooking demonstration. And it's been wildly successful. The students have had so much fun. The downside is we're not eating all that delicious food that they're making, but the upside is, is that they have a really good chance to hone their video, um, hone the, the strategies that they need to convey and they be able to satisfy the assignment. The other thing too is we I've used Flipgrid for when students have to tell their life story, which is talking about how to, to sequence events and how to use dates and, and use year numbers. ASL has lots of different types of number systems. And we just had them posted on Flipgrid so that the rest of the classmates could look at their, their stories. Now, most of our students, their story ends at like in their early 20s, but occasionally I have, I have um, older students in my class. And so they get to talk a little bit more about what's happened in their lives. So it's been a challenge going from face to face to remote. In this process of what I've learned is, yeah, the original recipe doesn't have to be like mom's, but it can be equally as delicious. And as long as it's enticing, engaging, it's good. It's not going to hit everybody um, on the right, the same taste buds all the time, but they need to know they can have lots of Ono, and that's in, in my language, that's delicious options. This whole thing, the last two years, has been this giant professional development opportunity. Um, it's been extraordinary. It's made me a better instructor. It's made how I present my class um, virtually and in person better when I'm looking at how I how I build my class the landing page has been better. It's taken much, much, much more prep time up front, but I have to say the results have been really swell. And yes, we will definitely get to questions shortly. One of the things, really truly happy surprise in amongst all the anxiety and really trying to support the students any way I can. And by the way, on I, KCC in general, but also and an, uh, my signature always has a link to, if you need, you know, students in need, press this. Um, my landing page has lots of resources for students. Whether they need academic support, monetary support, emotional support, mental health support, it's all there, which is incredible, which is great. I think what I've, what my students see now on the landing page is so much better than what I had done prior to COVID. So with all this anxiety and sort of like, ah, I don't wanna do, in, you know, I don't wanna do online learning. Actually, I just polled all my students and they're really, I would say majority of them preferring remote learning because I have students in South Korea, I have students in California, I have students in Florida and Georgia, besides neighbor islands, um, students at UH Manoa, which is only a few miles away from Kapilani Community College. It's not like it's far to commute, but it's saving students and keeping them safe from having to drive or to come over on the bus. So um, more than likely, we will continue to offer some of our sections remotely 
as well as having face-to-face -face sections provided case numbers keep continue to go down and things are safe. So building that better burger, I would say the new and improved version <laughs> is led to testing tests. Really, um, I changed how I give tests. I don't do paper and pencil anything anymore. And when we go back to face-to-face, -to -face, I'm not going to go paper and pencil. It's a little bit harder to correct, but it is so much easier for the students to navigate. We, we can also be paperless. So Google Docs and a template, I give them a choice during the test, they can write. Um, and then they have up to 40 minutes to be able to take their answers and, convert, and to be able to put them on the doc and then upload it to our site. They, I trust them. I know when they're, I, I know if people are sharing answers, it's very easy when it's a comprehension test. I can tell, I can tell by the, the, the vocabulary choices that they make. And um, I have video submissions on Flipgrid for everybody to see workbooks no longer do I have to look at them in person and check them off and have a stack I can just go ahead and have them scan their uh, or, you know, or just even take individual pictures of their workbook pages and submit them and it's great. So one of the things too that I think is necessary that has been able that has enabled me to be able to do what we need to do in class and do it effectively is ask, ask, and respond. So I do um, intermittent feedback. I do like a one minute feedback, you know, hey, how's it going? Um, it allows them, the students to see that I'm paying attention, that their opinions matter. And also it gives me a chance to maybe some, do some course corrections depending upon the class. Every class is different. And also gives some really positive relationship building. The other things that have I've had to do, again, making my classes more interesting, the land the landing page and our electronic management system more interesting, making the slides more alluring. Thank you, our professional development team here at KCC. Um, plus, as I said, links to student success resources and um, multiple ways of prevent presenting information and instructions and more tools for delivering instruction as you all were, you know, you were also quick to show how many tools you're using because it just makes the class so much more engaging. And then resources and options. As I said, there's so many groovy online tools, many of which are great for ASL and some of them are not just because they're more auditory based or they're more English based. And that's not what I'm looking for. So, um, but very cool is we have, and let me, let me continue actually this. Um, I love class recordings, but if we go face to face, that's going to be one sad thing that we'll have to jettison when we go back to face to face. And the fly in the soup is as our ASL classes and KCC in general is really known for our service learning. So Generally, we have opportunities within the deaf community because there is no deaf land um, for students to be able to interact with deaf community members in an authentic way. And that's the last two years we haven't been able to have, but we need to be able to supplement that with something else. And so finding out that there's lots of really great deaf creators on Instagram, on um, Facebook and on YouTube and TikTok has been great. So I'm having to look for all those links and now I've built um, a lesson page that's deaf culture and language experience. So they have to watch so many videos or they have to be able to um, read so many articles and things like that and then sign what they've learned. But it's gone from service learning to passive learning. And that's the sad part is that's that one component that's missing because we have lots of really great deaf community events where students are, are volunteering, they're involved within deaf community, deaf community gets to know them. So there's some ownership um, when students decide that they want to pursue and use ASL in all sorts of different ways, no matter what major they are. So I'm gonna show you my, um, this is a feedback form and I'm getting really close to being able to be done. So <laughs> next slide is questions and comments. So I use this and I used to do this as just a quick paper and pencil, send it out, you know, and then collect it and write, and I would draw on it and I would give feedback. Now what I use is a Google form. Um, I put this straight into the chat and they can immediately after class answer it. I also put in an announcement. 
so they can go ahead and and I get such and they can respond and they can respond to these prompts. I need to let you know I want to learn more about could you explain or review more about I like you're signing too fast too slow just right so. This was just a, this was just last week, as a matter of fact, and I was I looked at the feedback and so I thought i'm not going to point anyone out, but I can also respond, so this was a class that had. There was a first time with me. Um, I was doing something differently than the out their first ASL instructor, so I reminded them how they can see me better how they can see each other better. And this was just some things that had come up in the feedback and just reminding them again that their opinions really matter. And that they see immediately that it does because I'm integrating their comments the next, by the next class or so. So I'm gonna open this up to you and then we have one last activity. So let me go ahead and I would love to know what questions you have, um, anything you'd like to share where we go from face to face remote and then back to face to face, maybe. Um, what did you change? What did you keep? What did you jettison? So I'm gonna turn this off and stop sharing and have a chance to see. Hi, Jan. Steven Hi. here. I'm going to jump in and let you know that since we're in webinar format, uh, we won't generally be hearing from our participants, okay. but we do have Q and A. Uh, okay. And so I'd like to read those off to you. Please the do. first one is, did you ever have problems with students who did not have good connectivity at home or were all of your students well connected with enough high speed internet? Not at all. And in fact, not only did I have problems with some of my students having shoddy, really shoddy connectivity, wonky Wi-Fi, I did. So I actually don't teach from home, I teach from campus. I thought, great, yay. Well, it's not always perfect on campus. And um, I actually, where I, the room I'm in, I teach in my classroom, it's empty, but so the server keeps changing. And so one server is weaker than the other. And so all of a sudden I'm looking like this when I'm signing and it might say, I get this, you're looking chubby. So yeah, it's a constant battle. I mean, there was actually when my, previous laptop was starting to slowly kick the bucket. <laughs> I was having one nightmare after another. And I actually had to, I, there was one day I had, I started and stopped my class five times and it still didn't work. And I had to then just shut it down and get a brand new laptop. <laughs> so yeah, all the time. And it hasn't debated at all. Mm -hmm. I don't suppose there's any, uh, remedial answer really to that. It is what it is. So I'll move on to the next question. Thanks. This is a great presentation. My question is, not everyone is a fan of being filmed or being recorded in the virtual world. I had this issue with my students in the Arabic program at UC Berkeley. Did you have this problem? How did you deal with it? Actually, I, I'm surprised um, that my students, I think they know, first of all, they're gonna take American Sign Language as a visual language. So everyone has to be seen, everyone has to be on camera. Um, and, and then when I do breakout rooms, I'm recording. So as I go into break room to break room, it's still recording. And I have yet to have one student complain. Occasionally, I get a student back to today, I was giving a quiz this morning and one of my students had her wisdom teeth pulled out yesterday. And she said, oh my gosh, Jan, would you mind if I didn't have my camera on? It's like, of course not, it's a test anyway. And occasionally something happens, students are injured, they're sick. They get a buy for that day, of course, but no, really, no one has objected to being recorded. But again, the recordings are only for the students in the class. No one else gets to see them. That's a very important point that uh, the students understand it's not going to escape onto the internet. Right. So, um, Sarah, back to you. Fantastic. Oh, and we appreciate We have oh, one more question. question. Okay. We have more questions than I have an activity, one quick okay. activity. All right. Activity. Okay. Uh, Alegria is asking, visual appeal becomes an important tool in online teaching. Your slides are so beautiful. How did you create them? <laughs> this is where I want to thank our development and design team here at KCC. They are wizards. And I'm going, oh, my God, every time I go to one of their presentations, I think, how did you get those really cool graphics? Well, I find out things like Slides Go, which is what this presentation is from. Free, free phenomenal templates that you can easily move stuff around and really 
um, go ahead and tweak it to however kind of or whatever presentation you want. I do. Um, uh, I have little pixels that I put in pixels, pixels, excuse me, pixel people. And yeah, love free indeed. <laughs> I don't pay for anything. So, um, but I use so the little figures. You can go ahead and and I can um, dress them however I want them. I can whatever gender, whatever non gender specific um, images I want to put on. It's great. So I love them. I put them in. Yes, yeah, slides go. Thank you, Jim. Exactly. So yeah, it's it's really fun and some tools. And I love fonts. And yeah, I hope it wasn't too much. I was thinking like, oh my God, I'm like breaking all the cardinal rules of, of using PowerPoint. Now, if I had students that, um, and in fact, I have had students who not only taking a sign language class, but also have visual impairment, I have to then look at my backgrounds and figure out making sure checking with the student that it's working for the student. So let me quickly, I wanted to end with one thing if I can, and let me go back to sharing my screen. And there we go. I have a quick, quick for all of you. So here's the sweet, the sweet ending. If you, if you wouldn't mind, and I'm going to look at the screen in just a second, pick an emoji and you can, um, on the screen, you should be able to pick one. You're cooking. So you can relate to, <laughs> I know, ice cream shop, right? Um, if you can you can relate to what I was talking about and the challenges that we've all experienced making sure we're in we're enticing our students and engaging them and and figuring it all out um, that we're all in this together that um, maybe if there's some tips you want to swipe and maybe share with some pals and you're having a conversation with your colleagues you're still stirring knowing that there's tweaking more tweaking on the horizon and maybe it's got you thinking and that there's some still shopping and cooking. And so I would love for you to pick an emotion, um, an emoji, and I'm going to say go, and I'm going to turn off my screen, and I want to be able to see your emojis in your box, maybe if I can. I don't know if I can see everybody. If not, I'm, I'm not just... sure that in the webinar that we have oh. the capability of putting the emojis on our participating image, but we can put them in the chat. In the chat would be yeah. lovely. In the chat would be lovely. Thank you so, so much. And I really want to be give to give a huge mahalo um, to NFLRC, to Jim Yoshioka, to Sarah Bowden, and, um, and just really to all of you for being here today. This has really been an honor. It was wonderful. Thank you so much, Jan. We really appreciate you being with us. Mahalo.